Well, Vitalik, welcome back to uh, KPMG. Thanks, Simon. It's good to be back. Um, Vitalik, I'd just like to ask a couple of questions, if I may, to take the opportunity of being here. Um, let's start with insurance. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure you're a consumer of insurance products like the rest of us. Um, so wearing your hat as a customer, and also through some of the discussions mm -hmm. you have with some of the leading insurers around the world, what are you seeing or how do you think the, um, the blockchain technology development is going to most and best lend itself to insurance? And I think insurance actually is one of those areas in finance that could be relatively easy to apply to blockchains. I think the reason is that it's uh, an area where it's basically just about finance and data. So like fairly sim simple building blocks and I think data has been fairly freely accessible ever since the internet and uh, the finance side is becoming you know, more and more freely accessible, especially with blockchain technology coming in. So there is a, a fairly natural combination and I think we're seeing like both like individual companies starting to develop some applications like those like flight insurance pilots and <laughs> No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some like fairly large insurance company is just getting interested in the technologies that are dipping their feet. Yeah, and so um, how long do you think realistically it's going to take before we see wide scale adoption and use of blockchain in the insurance sector? Um, a few years. I mean, I right. think at this point it's a matter of. Uh, how it's packaged and like how to turn the basic idea into a kind of product that's easy for a mainstream or mainstream consumer to like use and understand. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Um, just turning to a slightly wider mm -hmm. conversation, uh, there's, there's, and, and the topic of governance, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's some concern I guess out there still around um, the lack of global standards around the use of blockchain, some concern around security of development of smart contracts and a general sort of um, uncertainty around what good looks like at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think we need to, or what do you think the industry needs to do to sort of improve um, and accelerate the, the comfort levels and, and governance around blockchain? So I, mean, I think there is no like single one blockchain governance challenge. I actually think there's a lot of different governance challenges. So one example is uh, if you look at you know, public chains versus consortium chains, mm. the challenges there are fairly different because when we're talking about consortium chains, you can have different consortiums, all of which have you know, their own different governance policies. And in a consortium environment, you expect those individual governance policies to be more, I guess, activist in certain ways. And uh, you m might expect that you know, if people want to kind of live under different rules, then it'll be more common to just kind of splinter off into sort of different consortiums and have you know, different services. Mm. On a public chain, on the other hand, it is something much closer to this kind of common infrastructure that lots and lots of people need to agree on. And in that case, you know, the governance questions are more about things like you know, how do protocol changes get decided on. And that's uh, like both the questions, I think, and like the tools that the different participants in the ecosystem have in order to sort of influence the answer to the question, I think are fairly different to anything that's existed before. Is if you mm. look at even like governance of a company, you know, you have shares, you have people at the top, and there's like this simple mechanism where you can just decide. And if you're looking, you know, oh, the, and the mechanism may not be simple in its application and practice, but you kind of understand what the rules are. Mm. If you look at open source software governance, there, that's a bit different because you know you have repositories and you have people that control the repositories. But if someone really doesn't like it, they can just kind of fork the repository off. Mm. I think blockchain, the public blockchains are kind of weirdly in the middle because it's a bit harder to fork a public blockchain and actually make a kind of successful splinter community than it is in you know something like Linux where you have like 270 flavors floating around today. Mm. But at the same time, it's not as hard as a corporation. So I think. The challenges there are kind of fairly novel. In kind of private blockchain land, I think it's uh, a bit closer to like things that have existed traditionally. From, so from a standardization perspective, like there are definitely challenges there too. At the same time though, I think it's uh, also very important not to standardize too early. Like I think a lot of the applications that people are developing right now, they're still like heavily experimenting. They don't really need to interoperate much. Mm. And I think the approach that actually make might make more sense is if we see some applications start happening first and then once we start seeing that you know oh look here is a category of applications that lots of people are doing then you know you can start talking about standardizing for everyone's benefit. Mm -hmm. 
you mentioned fork earlier, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure many purists would say mm -hmm. that uh, one of the cornerstones of the blockchain is its immutability. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, on the other side of the coin, I think a lot of pragmatists would say that to support wide-scale adoption, uh, the technology needs a degree of flexibility to rectify errors. Um, now, indeed, I think a, a global technology firm has recently announced an intention to um, develop or at least prototype an editable blockchain. Now, for me, as a bit of a layman and a non specialist in this in this area, I think the sort of hard fork occasionally in the early days to resolve a, you know a little ripple, for, forgive the pun, is one thing. But having a kind of continual ability to change the blockchain seems to be something quite different. Where, where do you sit on that spectrum? Is uh, yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I mean, I think. Like some people like to say, you know, oh, you know, it's this is this is binary. It's like being pregnant. You either pre your blockchain is either like pure or it's tarnished forever. I mean, you know, it's totally not like that. I yeah. mean, I think in reality there's definitely is a spectrum from you know all the way like not changing any single line of code for any reason ever to being okay with some kinds of changes and not others to being okay with some changes occasionally but not as like a regular thing and definitely not as something that happens like often enough that it turns into a centralized governance apparatus. Mm. And you know, there definitely are kind of different points on the spectrum that you can take. I'd also say that there are different applications that have different needs. And for in a kind of consortium chain environment, then you know, once again, more activist policies might make more sense. Whereas in a public chain environment, you know, like the amount of social coordination that it takes in order to agree on a fork is fairly large. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at a kind of, you know, quote, internet of value where we have like 3,000 applications running on it, like it's definitely not the case that any one of these is going to be able to rely on the ability to kind of go cry to mommy if something goes wrong. So I think uh, in the cases, like there are cases where you want some functionality that looks like reversibility, but there are like different ways of implementing it. So like one example is that you can implement like reversibility functionality actually like at the contract level. So even on top of a blockchain that is immutable in the normal case. Mm. So like I could easily come up with an app, let's say like some kind of like coin where the coin itself is defined by a contract and the rules of the contract, a contract actually can say something like, you know, the sender has the ability to revoke a transaction in the last 30 minutes or something similar. So what, that actually is a legitimate approach, actually codify as part of the rules themselves under what conditions like those kind of reversion events can happen. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the benefits of a blockchain like, is even if those things can happen, you still have this benefit of transparency, right? So like the fact is that if the system is designed that way, then you know I can go on some block explorer and I can it, see for myself every single instance in which some kind of reversion event actually took place. And like that by itself is pretty powerful. So just to give a concrete example, if you look at something like a land registry, for example, mm. you know, you might want to give you know the courts the ability to like seize land to give to give it to someone else because like what if you know ISIS buys up two percent of your country? It'll be a really wonderful thing to be able to just like you know click delete and just like <laughs> transfer the land back to the government. But uh, at the same time, you don't want you know corrupt officials to be able to just uh, s randomly you know like sort of you know slice a few meters off of people's property here and there once in a while. So mm -hmm. like using the transparency function specifically, I think that's like, is one sort of good way of looking at things. And I mean, another way of seeing things possibly is uh, there is the notion that people have been interested in lately of sort of partially smart contracts. Mm. So the idea here is that you might have a contract where there is part of the logic where you can be like really, really comfortable about the security, really, really comfortable about it being deterministic, really, really comfortable about it actually doing what it means. But there is also some kind of fuzzier and more complex part of the logic where you want to just like rely on some centralized arbitrator. And the nice thing that you can do is you can actually give the arbitrator powers in some contexts, but not in other contexts. And like one even example is that at this uh, devel uh, developer meetup, uh, in, uh, I uh, gave this example of like a two of three escrow where the arbitrator has the ability to kind of decide if there's a dispute between the buyer and the seller, but it's not like the arbitrator actually has the keys to the money and can just give it to themselves. So I think 
there is also like room for smart contract logic to be used in creating those kinds of sort of hybrid agreements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a uh, last question, if I may, you know, we're in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong's always enjoyed um, a very pivotal role as a sort of trade hub within Asia. And you'll be aware of the new China Belt and Road Initiative. I think um, a lot of people in, in town feel this presents a great opportunity for digitalization and to sort of jump on the digital mm -hmm. uh, journey and, and further reinforce Hong Kong's position. Um, do you see this as an opportunity for Ethereum in, in any way? I mean, are you I going to be engaging yeah. with the people that are making this happen? I, mean, I think there's definitely been a lot of adoption of uh, Ethereum in even like all, all the way throughout Asia. Mm. Like I even if you look at Singapore, if you look at you know a lot of interest in Hong Kong, there's a lot of uh, interest even like applications being developed from inside of China. And I even know that some of them are definitely interested in like trying to see if they can like cooperate between you know China and Singapore and so forth. So I think we're you know generally happy to work with people who are trying to make the world a better place. Very good. Well, look, Vitalik, I know you're a busy man. Um, it's great to see you back in Hong Kong. Great to have you back in KPMG. Um, thank you very much for your time and all the very best with helping drive the blockchain agenda forward over the next few months. Thank you.